Welcome to Occasional Randomness. I'm your host, Eric Scott, and joining me, as always, my fellow co-host, someone who loves a nice, quiet diner, Jason Johnson. Yeah, and I promise I'm not looking to burn this place down. Definitely. And by the way, have you seen my red stapler? <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, Milton. There. Yeah. Uh, Shout out to the uh, best film of all time. And if you don't know it, you can go, go Google red stapler. There you go. Yeah, and... It, I'm sure it's playing somewhere just like the Christmas story or whatever that movie is where you shoot your eye out at Christmas time. Yeah. It's always on. Or like every Marvel movie ever is always playing somewhere. <laughs> Speaking of holidays and such, now that we are back from all the holidays as we record this, we will pick up where we left off last time with our continuing journey through Farscape by recapping and talking about Season 3, Episode 19, I Yench, You Yench. Say that three times fast. I ain't you, you ain't you, you ain't you. Nice try. <laughs> it failed. <Yeah. laughs> and then we'll wrap up the last three episodes of Loki season two, and probably the last season, but we'll talk about that later. And as always, our little request from you, our listening audience: if you like what we do, please give us a like or review wherever you listen to this at, or help spread the word. And let people know about this fine little podcast. We would appreciate it, as always. All right, on to the title we can't pronounce. Farscape, Season 3, Episode 19, I Yench, You Yench, as I enunciate every syllable. Yeah, and you're going to do that for the entire recap, right? I think they mentioned it one time in the recap, and we're good. So I think, <laughs> so I only got to say it like two more times, probably, and we're okay. All right, so... We open with Talon and Moya drifting in space with another ship nearby. On Moya, Naj Gil, hey, remember him from last time? The nice, happy, peaceful Scarin? I'm sure he'll be in a lot of the episodes going forward. Yeah, I'm sure he'll be in opening credits soon enough. Yeah. So he offers Jewel the chance to join him on the medical ship that's next to Moya that he's preparing to leave for, telling her that staying aboard is far too dangerous and he can help her find her people, but she declines initially. Aaron returns from a recon, reporting that the ship is definitely a medical facility with five or six hundred on board, and they have agreed to take Naj Gill. Oh, okay, goodbye. Crichton is on command, and Shanna asks if there's been any word from Rigel and Dargo. Crichton says no, and she asks if they're definitely going ahead with the plan to go to Scorpius's command carrier. Crichton says that they will, so long as they can make a deal with Scorpius, and Rigel thinks he can. Shanna gets worried and argues that Scorpius doesn't deal, and is probably frying Dargo in the Aurora chair right now. Remember that from two seasons ago. Chiana says that it doesn't matter because she's out of here at the next planet they pass anyway. When suddenly she has a premonition of peacekeepers. And we cut to a diner on a rather desolate looking planet where Dargo and Rigel are eating, awaiting the arrival of our friend Scorpius. Dargo of course expects a double cross and then Lieutenant Bracca arrives to check for any others before Scorpius enters. Scorpius ensures that they're unarmed before his troops storm in. Haha. Uh-huh. Dargo can't fend them off, and Scorpius tells Bracca to prepare to execute them. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Bracca then asks where their rescue squad is, and Scorpius asks Rigel, who is still eating, and he could care less apparently, if he isn't afraid of death. Rigel tells him to go ahead and aim for the head, and says that if he's finished his games, they can get on with it. Scorpius says, okay, yeah, I had to be sure that you were alone, and tells his troops to lower their weapons. And as if on cue, one by one, Dargo starts to punch them out while asking Scorpius if he's sure he wasn't going to kill them. Rigel tells him to knock it off and says that they're here to talk, and Dargo takes their comms and crushes them, telling Scorpius to send his troops back to his ship. Meanwhile, in the kitchen of the diner, the cook, Voody, and the waitress, Esk, are unsure what to do with peacekeepers out there. Well, hey, you can serve and make some money. I don't know. They don't deal well with clients. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there's a business here. You got, to, you got to upsell the clients here. Yeah. Back on Moya, Jewel runs to the hangar, having changed her mind about staying on Moya, calling for Naj Gale, but Chiana explains that he just left. He just missed him. Jewel says that she has nothing against the peacekeepers, as she was never a prisoner, so she's leaving. Chiana then describes a premonition in which she mourned over Jewel, and when Jewel says she does not believe in her premonitions, Chiana just knocks her out. So, hey, there you go. Meanwhile, back in the diner, Scorpius asks if he's, if he's understood Rigel correctly. They want transport on his carrier, full amnesty, and relocation to a planet of their own choosing, where they can be free citizens, and in return, Crichton will help him with his wormhole research. Rigel says, yep, that's it. And Scorpius asks what prompted this. Rigel and Dargo explain that the goal for the Chared Scarin Alliance is to discover wormhole technology and use it. 
and though they stop the alliance once, they may be unable to do so again. So I quite would rather have Scorpius have the wormhole knowledge than them. Meanwhile, back in the kitchen, Voodie and Esk continue to argue back and forth. Back on Moya, Pilot announces that two peacekeeper ships are approaching, and Shanna lifts up Jewel, reminding her that she knew they were coming. Crichton wants a starburst, but they're too close to the medical facility. Grace gets Talon to target the ships and tries to get him to stay calm. We'll see how well that goes. Shanna thinks the Scorpius betrayed Rigel and Dargo, and they are now dead. The peacekeepers target them, prompting Aaron to decide they have no choice, and Grace tells Talon to fire, and he destroys both ships. However, as the unarmed hospital ship starts to move away, Talon targets that one as well. Kray screams at Talon to stop, but he destroys the ship in a single shot, killing everybody on board. We're going to need some more Scarens. Yeah, our little buddy Najgil. Oh, alas, poor Naj. Yeah, I really thought he was going to hang around. Yeah. Jewel slaps Kray, blaming him for the 600 deaths, saying he could have stopped them and thinks that Shiana knew. Crichton asks why Moy hasn't starburst in case the peacekeepers send more ships, but Pilot tells him Moy is refusing to move, as Talon is refusing to respond. Back on the diner, Scorpius agrees to the terms, but Dorgo wants a guarantee. Raka has eye-inch bracelets. Uh, there you go. Title drop. And that's what that word means. And Ah, we, we got it right in our guess, right? No. no. Yeah, we had no idea. What... <laughs> <laughs> they just made that word up. And Scorpius tells him to put one on and urges Dargo to do the same thing. Despite Rigel and Dargo's cautions, Dargo puts on the bracelet, and Scorpius tells Rigel to hit Bracca. Rigel headbutts him, but both Bracca and Dargo fall to the floor. The bracelets have synchronized nerve impulses, allowing them to feel each other's pain. If one were killed, both would die. Rigel agrees that that's acceptable, but asks who will wear them. Scorpius, of course, suggests Crichton and Bracca, but Rigel laughs, knowing that Scorpius wouldn't hesitate to kill Bracca if the situation arose, and demands that Scorpius wear it instead. Rigel explains that that's the only way they'll trust him, is if they can control him. Scorpius says that's unacceptable, so Rigel says, okay, no deal, thanks a lot, goodbye. However, just at that point, two armed aliens, Sko and Wa, suddenly storm the diner, guns blazing. One hitting Scorpius and Raka, the other finding Voodie and Esk in the kitchen. They say that they want everything they have, but Rigel says, we don't have anything. One of the aliens notices that they're peacekeepers, prompting the other to say that he never told them about peacekeepers. Hmm. One asks Scorpius where his troops are, and Scorpius replies that he has none, and he has no comms either, because the Luxon destroyed them. They send Voodie and Esk to cook some more food, and Bracca spots an opening to attack, only to be shot in the leg, which, because of the bracelets, also injured Dargo as well. Back on Talon, Kray says that Talon's in shock, but has expressed absolute remorse for his mistake. Jill says that it's much more than just a mistake, but Chris thinks a case of panic and extreme paranoia is certain to happen again. He declares Talon a danger to himself as well as to them. He says they should shut him down, all his mechanical systems, and although Moya doesn't like the idea and gets uneasy, he continues. He says that they would not be killing him, his biological systems will remain intact, and they could go to a place where they could repair the anomalies in Talon's character and come back with a full system replacement. Aaron asks, will that still be Talon? But Chris sadly says, no, he'll be different, brand new, but something has to be done. Rigel tells the aliens to hold the peacekeepers hostage, as they'll be more valuable than they are, and to think bigger than just mere robbery. He says that the peacekeepers will pay anything to get them back, and the robbery doesn't seem to be going as planned. He'd hate to see it when they mess up. One alien says that he'll make sure Rigel is inside when he burns the building down, prompting Rigel to realize that they're burning it down for Voodie as an insurance scam. Told you they hit his red stapler. Yeah. And as if on cue, Voodie and Esk emerge from the kitchen, and the alien tells Voodie that Rigel knows he hired them to burn the place down. Stapler and all. Esk gets angry at this, and she and Voodie argue again. The alien explains to his companion Rigel's plan, but Scorpius says, nope, he won't do that. Talon is refusing to let Kreis aboard, and Moy is still refusing to move. What to do, Aaron asks. Prompted Crichton to ask, you're asking me? And she says that they can still work together. They always did that very well. Crichton says that somebody needs to talk to Moya, maybe her, as she seems to share a special connection to Talon. So Aaron asks Pilot to let her speak to Moya, and she does. She tells Moya that Talon has been home and has saved their lives. She shared the best and worst of times with him, and she would never harm him. But Chris is right, they must shut Talon down. She swears that they will all work to bring him back as he was. It's the only way. Back on the planet, one of the aliens thinks he knows what the peacekeepers will do, but Scorpius explains that they have a far greater resource of wealth right here. Rigel the 16th, Dominar of Hynaria. He would get a much bigger ransom than Scorpius would. Back on Moya, Pilot announces that Talon has agreed to allow Kreis on board, and he begins ending his lockdown. 
However, suddenly Talon draws his cannon and starts shooting at Moya, causing serious damage, and everyone tries to hold on as everything explodes around them. <gasps> Shoot your mama. What's wrong with you? Meanwhile, back on the planet, Dargo is trying to keep the injured Bracca awake. Rigel says that Bracca needs water, but the aliens say they only care about Rigel. Hey, finally. They call the kitchen for food and water. When Rigel farts in a helium voice, Scorpius says that his bravery isn't convincing, and Rigel thinks they bought it. Because, you know, we know that Hynerians expel helium when they're nervous. Esk and Voodie continue to argue in the kitchen. Uh, still. Esk is unhappy, but Voodie proclaims he wants to start all over. One alien says they should just burn the place down. If, if they do the hostage plan, someone is going to die. The other one wants to take the opportunity handed to them earlier. Scorpius tells Rigel that they only have a limited window before they discover no one would pay anything for Rigel. Or anybody else. Scorpius says that they'll do it themselves if Rigel's up, up to it and tells Rigel the combination to unlock Bracca's bracelet. The aliens, meanwhile, describe their plans for the ransom, but Rigel says Scorpius' ship will just decode the transmission anyway, and they cannot outrun a Peacekeeper's attack marauder. However, Rigel says they could take his ship. It's very fast. But only Dargo can fly it. Esk brings out some food and water, and Voodie, having enough, finally tries to assert himself angrily, ordering Sko and Wa to just leave, as they actually work for him. That goes so well as Sko shoots him dead. Yeah, he should have just served him some crackers. Yeah, because you know, they don't matter. A tearful esque is left heartbroken as Voody utters his last words to burn this place down in my honor. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Rigel manages to whisper Braca the code to his bracelet, despite being caught chatting by the bumbling criminals. Crichton, Aaron, and Crace arrive on Talon, who aims his internal guns at them. Aaron tells Talon that he killed many innocent people and shot his own mother, and he wouldn't have done so if he weren't ill. He just panicked. Aaron doesn't believe he wanted to hurt Moya or to hurt them. She says he knows he's sick or he wouldn't have let them aboard, but he's not going to die. He'll be reborn and get a fresh start. They can take the pain away, and Aaron's words convince Talon to retract his guns. Dargo and Bracker are still lying down when one alien tries to convince the other to just leave. Rigel explains that they were meeting the peacekeepers to negotiate their freedom. They're prisoners. The aliens try to get Rigel to shoot Bracket as a show of trust, since Scorpius is more valuable. Rigel refuses, as it'll kill Dargo, too, and they have no one to fly the ship. So instead, Rigel turns and shoots Scorpius, who flies across the room, landing behind the bar. Yay. The aliens want to leave when Esk walks past. She whispers to Rigel that there's a knife under the tray behind the counter. Back on Moya, Rigel asks Aaron if she's okay, or if she's on talent, adding that he and Kreis could wrap it up and she could return to Moya. She declines, but thanks him for the offer. After Crace promises they'll do everything they can, and that he doesn't blame Talon and calls him very brave, they proceed to shut Talon down. Back in the diner, the aliens are trying to get Bracca up and want to kill Esk. Rigel stops them and tells her to go back to the kitchen. That's sexist. How could you do that? Rigel goes behind the counter to get the kill souvenir from Scorpius. Uh, of course, Rigel, Scorpius isn't dead, because that'd be the boring part of the series. Uh, Rigel apologizes for shooting Scorpius, but says he knows how it is. Scorpius asks how Rigel knew he was wearing body armor, and Rigel replies that being held captive for 131 cycles teaches you something. But even if he was wrong, it wouldn't be that bad, really. Rigel tells Scorpius about the knife and asks if he has something to offer. Scorpius hands him a pulse charge that he had hidden in his coolant system, advising him to use it wisely as it has just one shot. Rigel goes out and tells the aliens he's changed his mind, he would rather be dead than deal with the likes of them. Rigel says that they did not have a plan at all, and a fight ensues. Scorpius grabs a knife and throws it into the back of Sko, who spins around in pain, firing his gun randomly, nary miss missing most everybody in the place. Just as he's about to shoot Rigel, though, Rigel uses the pulse charge to blow him through a window, killing him. Bracca, meanwhile, has put his bracelet on Wa, and Dargo has knocked him out by banging his own head on the floor, <laughs> stating he has a much harder head when asked if he's okay. Rigel goes over to Scorpius to talk about their deal. Scorpius thinks that there's now a basis for them to trust each other, then throws a piece of food into Rigel's mouth in, in a gesture of their newfound alliance. Hey, look, they bonded. Yeah. We'll see how long that lasts next episode, right? Dargo and Rigel return to Moya, with Rigel proudly stating to Crichton that they got everything they wanted. Aaron says she still has a bad feeling about the command carrier, but they don't have a choice whether or not to go. Crichton says that some things you die for, but Aaron tells him that she can't watch that happen again. It was perfect, and he's just like him. He is him. Crichton says that he is me. He was on Moya. He missed the, that dance and says she shouldn't go. Aaron replies, no, they started this all together, and that's how they're going to end it. All right, some trivia about this episode. Apparently, in what appears to be an error, 
Tammy McIntosh is not credited in this episode, despite Jewel appearing throughout the whole thing. She should keep an eye on them about that. Hey! The Incompetent Robbers were a homage, or homage, to the 1974 film Dog Day Afternoon, starring Al Pacino. And the meeting in the diner between Rachel and Scorpius is also an homage to another Pacino movie, 1995's Heat, in which Pacino and Robert De Niro have a low-key meeting in the diner. I guess somebody liked Al Pacino films. Ben Browder and Claudia Black deliberately did not lock eyes until the final scene of this episode to emphasize the estrangement between the two characters. And as alluded to earlier, Jewel continues to wear her eye patch in this episode due to the eye injury Tammy McIntosh received in the prior episode. I see what they did there. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta keep your eye on the ball. All right, so we're getting closer and closer and closer to the end of the season. Only three more to go. So what did you think of this, I guess, preliminary episode that seems to set all that up? Yeah, at, at risk of sounding like a broken record, because I feel like I'm lost a lot of time when these episodes start, so maybe it's me. I, I had a hard time catching up at the beginning of this one. It, it's like there was a lot that happened between the last episode and this one, and we were just missing some kind of info dump at the beginning of it to kind of figure out what was going on. But as, as it went on, I you know got a lot more into it, and... There were, there were just several things like the beginning with the medical facility and the transfer that would have had more impact if they were developed, right? I mean, here we had these characters from the last episode. Uh, well, character, I guess, because it was the, the one. Only, uh, only, only survivor. Yeah. yeah, the only survivor. And we quickly shuttled them off to a, a medical facility and then obviously handled that whole plot point with a, a slight explosion and uh, no more hanging characters. But, you know, again, it, 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 there was a lot of pieces to get moved to get them onto the carrier in one episode. I don't know that I like, and we probably will discuss this in a little bit, the the robbery aspect of it. I think maybe they could have been handled differently to get that relationship going between Scorpius and our characters. But I, I think we'll get to that as we dive into it. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give him credit for keeping Naj Gill around because we saw him last episode and I guess they needed some way to have some drama here by blowing up the ship he's on and causing all the other drama but because you know you always wonder like people they met last episode now suddenly they're gone this next episode like they were just on moya where'd they go like it wasn't like season one when they meet stark the first time and then they, they take him with them at the end and it's like next next time he's gone is he still walking around moya somewhere where is he <laughs> so. yeah one one thing they're not good at is showing and I'm, I'm promise i'm not trying to nitpick but they're not good at showing the time jumps between episodes, right? Is it, are, are we picking up pretty quickly? Has it been like a month? You know, a lot of times we don't have context for what happened between our takes. And we were watching, you know, when, when you're, maybe you're, when you're watching them weekly or whatever, when they're coming out on, on, on network, and especially back when this show first aired, we weren't so used to the immediate follow-up, right? But now, especially when you're binging it through a streaming service, you know, it's, there's no time passing for us. And we're like, wait, what happened? We were just here, you know? So it just creates a, a disconnect a lot of times. Yeah. And there's been no, like, how long have Crichton and company been doing this? I know it's been like almost end of three years. So is it really three years of real time? Is it less, more? Because how long were they on Talon and Moya split, right? Months? Yeah. Weeks? Because, you know, him and them, him and Aaron developing that relationship, would just be like, you know, overnight or over a week or two. So it's, it should have been over months, probably. I don't, you know, who knows? Yeah, which is a great point. I think they'd, there'd be a lot more uh, understanding of the development if we knew the, the time passes. Because in my brain, it's a long time, right? I mean, I, I don't know that we ever find out definitively, but uh, I, I, I think they've been on the ships a lot longer than three years. So. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question from like a couple minutes ago, um, I liked it. it was, you know, some parts were annoying, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But you know, overall, it's nice to I guess see them setting up the plan versus just having them jump into the plan. And I always like to see like the build up, at least have them have some foreshadowing of what they're going to try to do or whatever, versus just them showing up and just doing things and then either like talking back on top of things like here's what here's what we decided to do as they do it kind of thing, which is. It's cute when that happens, but I like to see him actually do the planning and then see what happens. So it's nice to actually have that time to flesh it out, I guess. Which gives us uh, time to give Rigel some uh, a bigger role as he, I guess, is a central part of this episode because it's, it's his plan. I guess he gets to really sell it and play into his negotiating skills or con artist skills, depending on how you look at it. 
And as far as we know, from how it looks at the end here, with Scorpius and him being kind of buddy-buddy, he does get Scorpius to buy into the idea that Crichton really wants to actually help him finish his wormhole work and not try to kill him. So good job, Rigel. Until the next episode, we'll see. But <laughs> for now, though, seems like he got Scorpius on your side. And and to be fair, he, he convinced my, me some of the, you know, I mean, there was points where, uh, since like I kind of referencing my confusion earlier, I wasn't really sure what Crichton's plan was. And so I was going along with Rigel for a while. I was like, oh, yeah, they're they're teaming up with Scorpius. Like, this is this is a new plan, even though that's not the plan. And I should have known that. Was, Rigel was just that good at it. And I, I, I definitely enjoyed seeing a more Rigel-heavy episode that we've been kind of light on the last maybe season. Yeah, and you're kind of playing off of Scorpius's personality or his wand. He wants to be the one that controls all the wormhole technology. And if he knows that the Scarens and other people are having it and trying to use it, which they stopped them, so they they had a working device and they stopped them. So you're playing against you know his best interests. So of course he'd buy into it, right? Because he has to have it all. So well, and it's what he would do, right? Yeah. So, so. obviously that's what they would do. And uh, we do still get our nice little action comedy parts of Farscape, where we get Dargo fighting the Peacekeepers at first, and then after they put their weapons down and he knows that they aren't going to shoot him, he just starts randomly knocking them out. <laughs> until Rigel says, okay, let's stop doing that before we get really shot, and let's get on with what we're doing here. <laughs> so. Yeah, Dargo's just got a Dargo, right? I mean, and this is this is what they excel at, in my opinion, is, you know, this is exactly what Dargo would be doing in this situation, right? I mean, we've seen him through multiple seasons now. Uh, once the situation resolves and he's got a chance, he's just going to bust some heads. And, you know, are they going to stop him? No, well, he's going to keep doing it. <laughs> so... And speaking of busting heads, at the end, you know, he's he's banging his own head against the floor to knock out the uh, other alien because you know they both have the bracelets on. So you know, again, comedy and it works. So yeah, D- don't get paired with somebody with that high of a pain tolerance if you have a yinch, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, as we talked about in the recap, uh, looks like we have the sci-fi take on the old business arson insurance scam with our bumbling rob- robbery duo. You know, I guess you just can't set your business on fire and walk away. You have to have criminals do it for you. Uh, it's a little, a little over, overcomplicated. And uh, I guess that's about all I'm going to say about that C-plot is I really didn't really care for the aliens. Sko and Wa, they got my nerves. The way they talked and acted was just, I mean, it's alien. Okay, good job. You know, but it was just annoying. And, you know, of course, the, the mastermind behind the whole thing, Voodie, gets uh, the short end of the stick here when it all gets out of control and gets blown away for it. So good plan. <laughs> I mean, at least I hope S gets like insurance money or something from the restaurant as from what we learned at the end of the episode, Darbo and Rigel apparently did help them burn the place down for Rudy's last request. So, I mean, hopefully she got something out of it because otherwise she's walking away with no, no significant other, no job and no money, which would kind of suck. So, <laughs> Yeah, this this was another piece that I felt was was rushed, right? Because we didn't have enough development to make us care about these characters. Uh, obviously, we're invested in the the core four who were there doing the negotiating, you know, Rigel and Dargo and Scorpius and Braga. But well, Braga maybe, yeah, take it or leave it. But <laughs> but um, you know, these other guys, it's like they're serving these food, and you kind of get a little introduction to her at the beginning, but they just spend the time bickering. And so you don't really have any interest in them because they're kind of annoying and just sitting there bickering. And then the masterminds of Sko and Wa walk in and you're like, this is what you came up with. I guess when you need an arsonist, you can't really hire intelligent help, but it really just was rushed with no development and was just there as a device to mess up the negotiations between our core characters and then get the peacekeepers to agree. You know, once the negotiations fell apart this was their plot mechanism to get everybody to agree. And yeah, I, I think they could have found a better way to do it. Uh, obviously it was a moving front furniture episode to get things lined up, but yeah, the, the robbery C plot was, eh. although it did exist to give us the name drop of the half a title as Scorpius says, their I Yench bracelets and here's how they work. So we got to see how they work. So next episode or two, we won't be surprised, but other than that, it was a plot. I don't know. <laughs> it was things to do. <laughs> yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how those bracelets pay off, right? I mean, I guess we'll we'll figure that out as we go. 
yeah, I can see it. I can see them doing some comedy stuff with it, or I don't know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. But yeah, I, I can see Crichton playing with it. <laughs> a little, I don't know. We'll see. Because yeah, I mean that's kind of what they made a big deal about, you know, how the bracelets work. Because that's like the, that entire subplot basically is, you know, Dargo and Brecca dying and laying there because they feel each other's pain. So yeah, if if it is John and Scorpy hooked up together, then yeah, I mean, I can picture Crichton just doing silly things to tweak Scorpy or you know poke himself in the eye just to, just worth it to see Scorpius, you know, oh my, you know. Of course, we gotta be careful because Scorpius probably has a higher pain tolerance, being half. Uh, Scaring, so I can see him doing the same thing backward back to him too. So it could go both ways. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and I realize they're I think physical, but it'd be really cool if we could get some Harvey bleed over involved in that too, because we're we've been a little Harvey short the last couple episodes. Yeah, because now we only have one Harvey left, so can't bring Harvey back. Yep. And then in some kind of more comedy in this episode, we, I love that Rigel shoots Scorpius and then apologizes for it later, but doesn't really apologize. It's kind of like a backhanded apology saying that it really wouldn't have been a bad thing if he wasn't wearing body armor and he was dead. So, hey, oops. And a lot of people flying around this episode between that little tiny gun and the pulse charge. Lots of people, lots of kinetic energy in these things. People flying all over the bar. So, I guess, must have been a great day if you're a stunt performer. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot of, of stunts. And I, th- I felt like there was a lot of effects in this episode, too. We got a lot of space shots and, and blasting and stuff like that. So, I don't know. It feels like maybe we're close enough to the end of the season. They're burning some of their effects budget and some stunt budget too. Yeah. Although having said that now, I wonder if that's a good or bad thing. Cause yeah, this had a lot of effects, heavy stuff in it. So how much money they have left over for like the season finales. Right. So, but we'll find out. Well, ho- hopefully it's just an end of your end of your budget thing where they're like, Hey, you know, we have, we have to spend it or they won't give it to us next time. So we're just going to burn it on all these, all these episodes and they're just going to get better and better and better as we go. Yep. Yeah, we'll find out. And then back to the real plot, or the A plot, whatever you want to call it. Talon goes crazy, part seven, or eight, or not. Anyway, you get, you get the idea. So things have finally, abruptly, come to a head with Talon's character <laughs> and his decisions. <laughs> so not only in this episode does he blow away a, de- a defenseless medical ship, killing our poor buddy, Naj Gil, plus 599 other people. Very specific. Yeah. He also just about cripples Moya, like... You know it's really bad if you start shooting your own mom. <laughs> so. Yeah, and this one escalated fast, right? I mean, kind of back to our time reference, you know, of, of how long has it been? Uh, I know we've had issues with Talon over some past, as you referenced, but at the same time, you know, the crew was on him as their home for a, a while. So it was a pre- pretty dramatic jump for him to go from, you know, their home and, and a stable ish place to like you said shooting his mom yeah i mean they, they have been doling it out slowly over when they were on on, on talon that he was having some problems or i guess Crace and him had another merging of personalities or whatever that maybe made town a little more messed up you know i don't know maybe this is the end results but yeah i mean they're kind of ending the season if this is a big part of it so it's like i guess it's like okay guy wrap it up let's go you know <laughs> And I guess the only answer to fixing Talon sounds like the Leviathan equivalent of a frontal lobotomy or reprogramming. Obviously, the mechanical parts are what they are, so you can't change those. But they're going to rewire Talon's personality, I guess. I guess there's no like Leviathan, like Dr. Phil or something to talk to, or maybe the, the creators of Leviathans that we met back in Season 2 might want to maybe come and help. But again, we got three episodes to go. Probably not. <laughs> Well, and, and given that this is space, it'd probably be Dr. Spock, right? Yeah, no. right. Mm. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll put a maybe on that. I, I think my biggest confusion is how are they going to transport him around, right? Because they just shut down all of his tech. And so his tech is off and his bio whatever's in uh, suspension. So are they going to like tractor beam him or... You know, yeah. hook some cables. How, how are they dragging this other Leviathan around? Or not Leviathan. Yeah, whatever, <laughs> around. Because he, he's too big to go into Moya's docking bays now. So actually he's probably too big when he first came out back in season one. So it wouldn't, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, either you have to like, what do they call it? Like a, a net? Or like, what, what, yeah, either like have him, yeah, towed or something. Or you can like stash him on a moon somewhere while you go deal with the command carrier next episode. Like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, we got some, some stuff to be doing. We can't be like, you know, dragging a... Uh, record service around for a 
another chip. So yeah, we're now some of them stay with Moya and Talon, and the rest go on the command carrier, and that makes the plan work. I don't know, who knows? We'll find out. Yeah, let, let's split the crew again. Yeah, because that worked out so well the first time. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> but then we did some nice scenes with Aaron and Moya and Aaron and Talon because they really play into her empathy with Leviathans. You know, some nice, nice dialogue and nice little touching scenes of her talking to the air. You know, basically. <laughs> but yeah. Which, which, which I did enjoy, right? I mean, I like the the. I, th- I think what she said was great. I did have a bit of a hang up where I was like, "Can't Moya hear them anywhere on the ship?" What What was special about her going into pilot's chamber and asking permission to speak to Moya? Like Moya's not already listening. So that that always confuses me a little bit. I was kind of expecting maybe to see the callback to her taking advantage of her pilot DNA transfer and uh, being able to actually do some kind of physical communication. Yeah, and plus didn't one time they talked to Moya through the DRDs? So, I mean, they're all over, over the place too, so... Yeah, but, like... Yeah, well... I, I think they forgot she has that DNA. I think that's been a, a written-off plot point. Well, it was a bad episode, so, I mean... <laughs> where she got that, so... Yeah. But we all want to forget that episode. <laughs> Evidently, they did it. Yeah. So. <laughs> and I guess finally we have a nice couple of ending scenes with Aaron and Crichton. You know, they're still figuring out their new relationship, uh, but at least it's progressing, right? It's not as frosty as it was last time where she had anything to do with them. So you can kind of see it slowly getting back to at least the way it was before they started getting romantic with each other. Just a nice working relationship. But you know, we all know where we want, it, we want it to go. So it's like, okay, yeah, give them time to, you know, get over it and get back on the horse, so to speak, and, you know, get back in the groove. But it's nice to see that it's not just a thing that happens they're, they're, they're progressing it they're, they're moving it along yeah I, I still expect this to move forward before the end of the season but you know i may be wrong I, I like you say i think we'll at least get back to the way they were before getting split up and cloned and everything but uh, yeah yeah we'd like to see it move past that and kind of where we were with the other john yeah because knowing how our, all our farscape uh, crews plans go i'm sure next episode will just be perfect as exactly like they scripted it so and there won't be any kind of drama or where Crichton's almost going to die again and aaron has to make a choice or comes to some realization or whatever and then they get all close together again yeah yeah Crichton's 11 is going to go great yeah so, anything else to talk about this episode before we move along no nah, unless you want to try to pick what the, the title for the next episode means i think we're good to go no nope. Yeah, so speaking of which, so next time we'll do Farscape Season 3, Episode 20, because that follows 19. And it's Into the Lion's Den, Part 1, Lambs to the Slaughter. So playing our usual guessing game of what does that mean? Well, unless the title is lying to us, it's at least a two-parter. See, it says Part 1, so. (laughs) And as we've said every single time they do one of these multi-parters, we love it. They do multi-part episodes very well, and we've made that totally clear since Season 1. So, obviously, to break this apart, the crew of the lambs going to the slaughter on Scorpius' command carrier to try to stop his wormhole research. And as we said before, it's clear from this episode, well, clear, we think, that Scorpius thinks they're there to help. So we'll see how long that lasts before it goes off the rails. If it's a two-parter, I'm probably going to guess probably through most of part one, it goes wonderfully. And then it falls apart in part two, or at the end of part one, going into part two, which I guess then leaves us the last episode of the season is like a wrap up or something else or to start some new cliffhanger or something. I don't know. I can't remember anyway. Or this could be a three-parter like the look at the princess trilogy from the prior season. But I don't know. I don't, I don't see him stretching this out to three parts because that look at the princess one was probably a solid two and a half parter at the most. So <laughs> yeah, I'll agree. I think we're going to get a, a two-parter. Because I, I would like to see, especially with all the plot points they've got going on, at least one episode to wrap up the season, right? Otherwise, we're going to end up with a, a cliffhanger going across, which I think they have done before. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, things are definitely not going to go as planned, at least in the first one with a title like Lambs of the Slaughter. I, I, it so- sounds a little ominous. Uh, I'll, I'll go with that. Um, yeah, I, I can say it, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think it'll go well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll go about as well as all the other plans go until they yeah. pull something out of the hat to save the day at the end. So. Yep. Because this is season four, so we know that <laughs> they, make, they make it that far. <laughs> so. And the two-parter movie after that, so we knew they make it past season four, so we know. At least somebody does. Well, you know, 
at least it's called the same name of the of the, of the show so <laughs> yeah it's it's really just gonna be stark at that point but yeah all, all the people that left the ship be stark it'd be like you know, nash gill wasn't killed he's he survived and it'd be him and stark running around no probably not so. probably not <laughs> all right so that is your farscape homework and coming up after the musical theme interlude here, we'll discuss the final three episodes of Loki Season 2. All right, so we did the first three episodes of Loki Season 2 last time. So that means, obviously, that this time we'll wrap it up with the final episodes four through six of Loki Season 2. Which starts us out with Season 2, Episode 4, Heart of the TVA. So we see Ms. Minutes revealing that in the past, Renslayer, picking up from right where we left off, uh, commanded He Who Remains Army. He proposed to lead the TVA with Renslayer, but then had Ms. Minutes erase the memories of Renslayer and all the other TVA employees. As the temporal loom reaches catastrophic failure, Loki and its allies attempt to use Victor Timely and Ouroboros' throughput multiplier to fix it. Ouroboros reveals that the source of his knowledge is Timely himself in an ontological paradox. Say that three times fast. Nope, I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) Renslayer and Ms. Minutes attempt to take over the TVA, approaching the detained Brad, General Dox, and her loyalists for help. Only Brad agrees, and Dox and her loyalists instead choose to be crushed to death by Ms. Minutes. Much to Brad's dismay. <laughs> yeah, he... Uh, or at least shock, anyway. Maybe not dismay, but... Yeah, it, he, he kind of compressed through that one. <laughs> <laughs> Brad prunes Hunter D-90 and kidnaps Timely. While staging a rescue, Sylvie and Loki encounter his time-slipping past self, and Loki prunes his past self. Ouroboros deactivates Ms. Minutes and the TVA's magic-suppressing devices. This enables Sylvie to enchant Brad, controlling him to prune Renslayer. Rescued, Timely restores access to the loom, but when he approaches the loom, the increased temporal radiation spaghettifies him before the throughput multiplier can be launched. The temporal loom explodes, and the blast wave spreads towards Loki, Mobius, Sylvie, B-15, Casey, and Ouroboros in the TVA. And well, that's the end, folks. No, it's okay. <laughs> But nope. Then we go into Season 2, Episode 5, Science Fiction, or Science Slash Fiction. So yeah, it would be kind of a boring series if that was the end of it. So Loki survives the explosion, but everybody else has vanished, and the TV headquarters spaghetti fires. Loki escapes as he begins time-slipping yet again, taking him to branch timelines where his friends Mobius, Hunter B-15, Casey, and Ouroboros were reset to their original lives as Don, Dr. Verity Willis, Frank Morris, and Dr. A.D. Doug, respectively. Wanting to time slip to before the explosion, Loki enlists Doug's help. With Loki unable to control his time slipping, Doug proposes Loki gather everybody present at the explosion back together so that their collective temporal aura can send them back to the right time and place. Doug couples together a temp pad using the TVA handbook that Loki kept, and Loki uses that to succeed in gathering everybody else to Doug's workshop except Sylvie, who has retained her memories, but refuses to help. She does, however, make Loki admit his true motivation. He wants his friends back and fears being alone. When everything in Sylvie's timeline spaghettifies, she goes to help Loki. Oh yeah, a good idea. However, Doug's workshop also spaghettifies, as do everybody there. Frank, Doug, Don, Willis, and Sylvie. But Loki finally manages to control his time slipping by focusing on a person. Declaring that he can rewrite the story, Loki time slips to before the explosion by focusing on Ouroboros. And capstoning with Season 2, Episode 6, Glorious Purpose. Loki time slips to the moment before the temporal loom's explosion. Despite his attempts, the loom ultimately fails to accommodate the infinite branches. Loki slips to the moment before Sylvie kills who he remains, who tells Loki that the loom is a failsafe. Overloading it protects the sacred timeline by deleting the branches along with the TVA. He who remains suggests Loki kill Sylvie to save the loom, which Loki rejects. After consulting Mobius and Sylvie at different moments in time, Loki replaces Timely in approaching the loom. Loki destroys the loom, magically rejuvenating the dying timelines, and rearranges them into a tree-like structure, committing himself to oversee the branches alone at the end of time. The TVA now tracks He Who Remains variants across the growing branches. 
with Mobius reporting one variant being stopped at Earth 616 adjacent realm. B-15 becomes one of the TVA's leaders. Ouroboros reactivates a now friendly Ms. Minutes and writes a new TVA handbook with Timely as co-author. In one timeline, Timely did not receive the TVA handbook. Renslayer awakens in the void and encounters Aoth. Mobius retires from the TVA and he and Sylvie observe Don and his children from afar. Yeah, so that is the seemingly all wrapped up in a bow season two of Loki and probably the series too, I guess, because they pretty much wrap everything up. Although I think there's several ways to go if they really want to do a third season. But overall, what'd you think about the final half of the season? So saving the actor discussion for a bit, I'll say that the Loki show just, they, they keep being the best of the MCU TV for me. It, it hit all on all cylinders. And I, I really enjoy the fact that I don't see it all coming. Right. I mean, some of these shows are, are pretty predictable and you know, you're point A to point B. And while you can enjoy the ride, you see it. Whereas this show is just constantly like, I have no clue what they're going to do next. And, and they constantly do what I don't expect. And I really enjoy that. Yeah. And I usually don't like short, seasons like six episodes or less which i know that's the new newish thing but the six is even on the small end of or the short end of you know these later episode seasons but in this case i think it really helped because the writer's room or the writers or whoever designed this could kind of as we'll talk about later you know have, have all these little callbacks or like oh she's, she's happening over here in this episode okay i wonder what that's about and then they five episodes later they tell you what it was so yeah you'll get an entire episode just on that right i mean it's... yeah so i love how they like tied everything up and everything relates to everything because it's all timey-wimey and like we said last time i love how they're playing around with time how they just do things because they can and it's tight it works you know i'm sure if you think about it too hard you're like well that doesn't really work that way but it doesn't matter because it's the way they wrote it and acted it and whatever it's yeah it's just excellent i love it all right so let's talk about some things here let's see so yeah we start off we ended episode three with you know miss minutes saying like i know a secret about you renslayer and at least they didn't forget about it they jumped you know like right into episode four they talk about it which you know renslayer was kang's army commander and i guess helped stop that big temporal incursion by the evil kangs where they had all those murals and the tva about you know that kind of stuff and I guess help found and help probably build the TVA or at least populate it maybe with the people. I don't know. And was going to lead it with them. But I guess as we learned before from Timely, he doesn't like to share. So he decided to erase her memories and everybody else in the TVA, which explains that also. Why, like Mobius could remember meeting Ouroboros before, that kind of thing. Not really sure on her storyline, like what her plan was with taking over the TVA. I mean, I guess to go back to the way things were before, like go back to pruning timelines and I guess go to the end of the time and rule like Kang used to. I don't know. I guess, you know, if she couldn't be the boss before, she'll be one now. But even if that would have worked, it'd been too late anyway, because the you know, loom was ready to explode regardless. So she wouldn't have had any luck anyway. <laughs> so, oh, well. <laughs> and at least she kind of gets her reward later by getting pruned, which sends her to the end of time. And she sees Alioth and probably gets eaten. So there you go. Just desserts, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll caveat that one with a maybe. And this is probably just, you know, wishful thinking on my part. But that scene where you see her at the end, not to jump all the way to the very end of the show, you know, she's, you, you kind of, she looks up and sees a pyramid also, which could be a Rama Tut reference, which is a, a, a Kang variant mm -hmm. we saw in, um, elsewhere. So, you know, it'd be a cool way to bring her back if she gets paired up with Rama Tut or something. But yeah, as you kind of alluded to, this, this may be the series end. And if that's the case, yeah, she's just eaten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things they can do if they had a season three. So they left openings enough to where they didn't end it, end it. But yeah, I mean, we'll see. But if not, then it is what it is. And you can, you can, make, you can make up your own answer what happened to her. But, yeah. yeah. I have some pretty good, good fanfic there going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like I said, that they really went for the timey wiminess in these episodes, which I said before, if they can plan it out the correct way by having total control over the series, then it's, you know, they can pull it off properly. And they did it here. We get to learn that, I think, well, episode one, like when Loki got pruned, when Loki had to prune himself, or, you know, Loki had to get, get pruned when it was the right time to stop his time slipping, that it turns out it was he himself that pruned himself, but not the way you probably thought. Like he used to probably prune himself by sticking himself with the 
prod, but now it's Loki behind him, stuck him with it. So it's okay, a little, little play on that, cool, like that. We have Loki trying to stop Sylvia from killing Kang about a million times, who knows how many, because um, it goes on and on and on. Shades of a Doctor Strange versus Sister Mamu in the first Doctor Strange film. Uh, we get all the little weird bits of Loki time slipping around the TVA, where he gets to see himself do it <laughs> this time around. So it's kind of fun. And yeah, like you said, the, the, the ontological paradox, and I'll say that word once and that's it. Uh, apparently, Timely and Obi influence each other's work to create the TVA and its systems and the handbook. So that's kind of a nice little weird time loopy thing. And I guess the funniest and biggest kind of timey wimey thing is uh, Loki learns engineering and physics a small tiny bit each time over a period of centuries, because it says like centuries later in the, in the credits, in the scroll, which is hilarious, as he's trying to stop the loom from destroying everything. So it's kind of like Shades of Groundhog Day. So they kind of like wrapped up, they kind of like threw every timey wimey reference they could think of in these last episodes. Yeah, the the Groundhog Day reference was exactly what I was feeling as I watched this. You know, it's like centuries later and you're like, that's awesome, right? You know, because, you know, if you, if that's what he's got to do, he keeps slipping. It's good, he, you know. What, what's time to a god, right? So let's just do it. So yeah, and how did that even work? I mean, can you just imagine? Like, I don't know how many how many minutes, hours, or whatever they had, days, or whatever it was between when the loom was going to explode uh, and up to that point. So they keep turning back to. So how do you how do you explain to to Obi? Yeah, by the way, forget all that. I, I know what's going to happen. It's my my four hundredth time doing this. My four thousandth time doing this. Whatever. You know. By the way, I need to learn physics. Now here's where we stopped last time. <laughs> Like how do you how do you do that and then keep going like and how many well, and, and how many times over the centuries did they do that and, and it wouldn't have been near as much fun but he could have slipped time slipped three hundred fifty years back and got a lesson from Obi at that point right instead of having to do it in those four minutes over and over again but that makes it more funny yeah because it's kind of like it's fun to watch each time okay we'll try this okay and we get a certain point no okay forget that okay next time we get like one more step further down the down the the, the long walkway nope darn okay try it again all right. <laughs> Right, <laughs> and it's like you seem getting closer and closer and closer and closer. <laughs> well, and and you know what you don't see is you know in all those different tries, you know, did he send each crew member out to see if they could get further? Right, you know, this time he kicks Mobius out. No, it's your turn. You know, they, yeah, like I, I made different variations of that that they go through in, in centuries, right? Yeah, and and not go insane <laughs> by trying to do it either. So, and then um, but yeah, up until that point though, um, episode four it looks like everything's going their way. They managed to rescue Timely. Uh, they help Obi with the device that can widen the loom, and he goes out to be a hero and save everything. Timely, you know, volunteers. And I was at first thinking, okay, well, obviously, Timely's going to do some double cross or something. Like he's he's already worked with Renslayer off off camera because he was captured by them, and they made a deal or something with her and Miss Minutes. But nope, he just gets spaghettified. Loom explodes. Everything's dead. Oh well, goodbye. And the end the episode. <laughs> nice. very, very very nice twist there. Yeah, and I was, I'll, I'll mention, I was watching this one with my family, and while it was getting really late, and we were like, okay, we're just going to watch one more episode, and this was the one we watched, and it's like, okay, that was such a great cliffhanger. I can't imagine what it would have been like if you couldn't just immediately move to the next one and watch it, because that's exactly what we did. It didn't matter how late it was. <laughs> we just went ahead and watched the next one, because you got to. Yeah, and having not watched any of these things as they came out week by week, we I watched them all at the end, too, so it was nice to be able to go, all right, next episode. <laughs> So it's like, wow, didn't see that one coming. Let's see what happens. You know. Yeah, if, if I'd have had to wait a week, I probably wouldn't have been happy about that one. <laughs> and then at least we get the uh, backstory on the former lives of our main characters. So, you know, what they were like before they got to the TVA. We learned that Mobius was a single father of two kids and a bad jet ski salesman from the look of it. B-15 was a doctor in the hospital. That's cool. Casey apparently was a prisoner on Alcatraz <laughs> and tried to escape. And Obi was a failed science fiction writer who moonlights as a scientist, of course. But um, I, I love how he's trying to sell his book at the store that you know he didn't have. You know, they weren't really selling, and they're like, "We don't." Have, they're trying to scan the book, the, the barcode. Like, we don't have this in the system. And the woman's like, "Get out of here! We know <laughs> stuff. We're, not, we're not trying to sell your book." Trying to buy his own book that he stocked on the shelf. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. That's actually a bunny loss. Yeah, I was like, like mm -hmm. not not quite sure of the marketing strategy behind that one, but okay. Uh, and then in the end, uh, Mobius decides to, I guess go back with his wife and kids, maybe? I'm not quite sure. It seemed like it, because he said he retired, so is he just going to stare at them? Anyway, but maybe after after centuries of being a TV agent, he might have better skills and salesmanship now if he tries to go back to being a jet ski salesman? I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, though, at least my take on this, and I know it's, you know, there may be other ways to make it work, but 
yet he can't go back to that life, right? Because that timeline was his timeline was pruned, and this timeline has its own version of him as the father. So it's kind of that that Scarlet Witch conundrum from that last Doctor Strange movie, where you know you can't replace that innocent variant with yourself. So mm-hmm. he just gets to stand there and watch time pass, as he says. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't sure how that w- would fit in. Like, was was his timeline pruned, or was he pruned? Because I don't know if they ever explained it in the last season. Yeah, I don't know. The, the, the way I always understood it was like most of the TVA people were from timelines that got that got pruned, right? So they, but but they would, I guess, Kang or whoever set up the TVA, Renslay or whatever took all the people out of their initial timelines and and then blew it up then pruned yeah. it yeah. yeah could be yeah or i guess you could find a timeline where you go to work so to speak and like you die in an accident on the way to work or something and then you just kind of step in and then you're like daddy i don't know I mean, you know it's, anything's possible in timey wimey stuff but i don't know you'd have to play that really yeah. right but yeah <laughs> or he's just a weird guy that just doesn't do tv work anymore because he says he's retired but he's kind of pops around and watches his kids from afar which is not at all creepy <laughs> Yeah, he, no, he can. You know, there's probably a jet ski place across from Sylvie's McDonald's somewhere. He can just go. You know, yeah, yeah, work there. He can start the jet ski tra- craze years before. I mean, yeah, he's got his own tent pad, so he can go wherever he feels like. Yep, and um, because I looked it up just because um, apparently Casey's real self, or at least this variant that the show was based on, an actual true person uh, named Frank Morris. He was a prisoner in Alcatraz back in the '60s. And he and two others did escape, like it was shown in the episode. You know, they tunneled their way out, they climbed up on the roof, they had the boat made up of, like, I don't know, rubber and duct tape or whatever it was. But in our reality, at least, they don't think they made it to shore and probably drowned in the San Francisco Bay there, unlike in the show where they made it. So, hey, maybe they really, really were picked up by the TVA and just not just Casey. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, so funny aside on this one, and, and I'll caveat it with it's probably completely historically inaccurate, but I had a, a family friend of a friend type situation who claimed that uh, they were related to, it wasn't Frank Morris, it was one of the other escapees from this Alcatraz escape. So I'd actually heard of it before. Huh. And they were, one of the other two that they claimed was a, a distant relative. And of course their their claim was that they made it and just, you know, actually, actually pulled it off and it was covered up. But Either way, uh, I always thought that was funny when I come across it. I'm like, yeah, I actually remember that uh, from a family story. So yeah. So now, now the question is, which came first? Did someone decide that Casey was beefing Alcatraz, and then they did some research and found out some people that escaped and maybe didn't, and like, hey, could, we could use that. I don't know, or I don't know. <laughs> so, but anyway, good writing and kind of cool if you if you knew about it or if you dug into it, then you, you get the little layers upon layers of what the writers were doing here, which is which is great. Well, and as you point out, it's kind of interesting because that's one of the few real world references we get in these type of shows, right? Yeah, I, mean, I think the closest we got in the f- for the first season was like one of Loki's variants was D.B. Cooper, you know, the guy that stole all the money and jumped out the plane and disappeared. Exactly, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And uh, Sylvie just really wants to stay at McDonald's. She doesn't want to help Loki. You know, she's quite content to stay there and do her, I don't know, maybe now she's a manager. Who knows, whatever. She's got, you know, she's having fun at McDonald's. Oh, she's got that cool bar to hang out at, yeah. too. So. But then only when her timeline gets totally uh, spaghettified, and she's like, yeah, I'll go back and help. Which, yeah, of course, because <laughs> now you've got nothing, right? So yeah, I'm either going to die or I'm going to go help now. Um, well, she is a Loki, right? I mean, yeah, I mean she's, she's not, a variant, but she's, yeah. she's still a Loki. She still has the same general core of her being, I guess. Yeah. Which is kind of good, as Loki at that point had kind of given up. And was just going to let everybody go back to where they were, and oh well. Uh, so it's kind of like you know, our, our hero at his lowest moment before he gets the aha brainstorm and how to fix everything so yeah which led to the revelation of what actually makes time slipping work yeah just focus on the person you really want to be next to or around and boop there you go yep and um actually it turns out that that's what they're trying to do wasn't what had to be done as we learned because can't get missed that that loom has a failsafe which would destroy everything including the tva but to, in order to keep the sacred timeline intact although i'm guessing at first i'm thinking like okay well then what like if the Loom blows up and they got one timeline, then it's gonna start branching again. So then, what Kang's gonna come back for the end of the time and rebuild everything? Uh, I, I guess. I mean, for the end of the time, you're still there. I don't know. I, I don't get it. Unless the loom blows itself up and recreates itself. I don't know. They don't really explain it too much, but I kind of get where they're probably going with it, but just a little confusing. Yeah, it, it's one of those don't get too wrapped around the axle, I think, of, of, of how it would work. 
but he kind of does say that he would recreate the TVA and start the cycle all over again. So in all, in, in your character names are kind of a reference, right? It's, it's one big Mobius strip or uh, Ouroboros, which is a snake eating its own tail, right? So it's just one big loop. You know, yeah. What, what was, isn't it going to be, and will be again? Yeah. So again, good writing then. That's what it comes down to. Good sneaky writing. And then we get the, the big ending where Loki finally gets away. He's always wanted to rule over something. You know, at first he wanted to rule over the Earth in the Avengers movie. Then he wanted to rule like Asgard. Then he wanted to rule like just the universe. So now he's kind of really the guardian of the entire multiverse, I guess, watching over everything. Did love the uh, nod to North, Norse mythology as the timelines he was weaving together looked like Yggdrasil, the tree of life or the world tree, whichever you want to call it. That's a big central point of Norse mythology. Um, so wh- whether that's just Loki's way of processing all the timelines as something he's familiar with, or if that really is Yggdrasil, um, I don't know. If it really was that, that, that would be awesome, as that would be a way to tie up a nice bow of the entire Loki cycle from beginning to end, right? <laughs> It'd be a nice cap to the beginning of the Marvel Universe, <laughs> sort of, to like where we are now. Yeah, I, I really like that symbolism, too. And I, I was thinking about this as... as I. I I paused it right there and kind of showed my, my family the, the Yggdrasil and kind of explained that for those who weren't as familiar with it. But, you know, again, they, they don't touch on it in this show, but Asgard's been destroyed too, or at least in our timeline, Asgard's destroyed, right? So that kind of breaks Thor's original Yggdrasil drawing he did in the first Thor movie all the way back then. So this kind of is a rebirth of the Tree of Life after it's being messed up by Asgard's destruction. Yeah, so if somebody really liked what the the whole Loki Norse thing, they wrapped it all up in a nice nice little bow. Assuming this is the end, which we can talk about later. Uh and then yeah, I guess another possible like hero but Perik victory kind of thing. Loki admits he wants his friends back and he, he didn't want to be alone. And now here he is at the center of the multiverse, all alone. Now I I couldn't tell from his final expression as he's sitting there. You know, because it was a pretty neutral-looking phase, so I couldn't tell if he was sad at being forever alone or kind of in my own little head canon. You know, maybe he can eavesdrop on his various f- friends or their lives and kind of live vicariously through them. Hopefully, I, I hope so, because otherwise it's kind of a depressing ending <laughs> for him anyway. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like he'll find a way to do both. I don't think he'd be content, despite all the character growth, to just sit there all isolated. He'd, he'd have to figure out some way to cheat the system, and. I wanted to throw in the reference that he is the god of stories now, right? After all, and and that god of stories comes from uh, a series that I haven't read, but I guess some of the new Loki stuff has actually had him take on the mantle of god of stories in the multiverse, or at least some variant does. So maybe that's some interesting comic tie-in to look up. So. Yeah, could be. And then we kind of get some uh, name drops or, or little nuggets of uh, Kang. Uh, we get the reference to the Ant Man Quantum Mania movie as the TVA is now tracking Kang's variants, apparently. So we got a nice Earth 616 reference. Kind of cool. Uh, see, Miss Minutes is now rewritten and not a crazy AI anymore, hopefully. Yeah, temporarily. Yeah, well, we'll see. Obi rewrites the TVA handbook, version 2. Kind of funny. And a different color. Now it's yellow instead of orange. And I'm guessing Sylvie goes back to Oklahoma and her McDonald's job. Although, sounds like she could help the TVA if needed. Which... That could be a way to keep the series going. If if Tom Hiddleston's done, then you can bring you know, Sylvie in because it's just another no Loki variant. You know, had a big role and could just continue that. But like we said before, if not, everything got wrapped up on a good note and we can walk away not wondering what happened. Yeah, I d- definitely agree with that. I, the only I, I'd want to go on for selfish reasons because again, this is probably my favorite of the MCU TV shows. But I, I guess this is also where I'll mention that the actor who played Kang has officially been let go by Marvel uh, following legal mumbo jumbo. So we don't know yet, or at least they haven't said yet, if at the time of the recording, if they're going to recast it, which you know can easily be done with variants, or if they're going to move on to a different bad, big bad, for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which uh, a lot of the rumors so far have been circling around Doctor Doom. Uh, they've been wanting to bring the Fantastic Four and all that in anyway. So why not make Victor Von Doom the the new super bad big bad for Marvel? But I don't know that we know at this point, and it'll be interesting to see where they go. Yeah, I've seen stories here and there from websites who are not notoriously accurate or uh, truthful with things. Let's, let's say that there are rumors of recasting Jonathan Majors 
Kang role with another actor. So, which, I mean, as we said, you can do it for sure because it's, it's just a variant. Variants can look like anybody, anything, you know, male, female, different skin color, whatever, it doesn't matter. So it's a variant. You know, the universe is your playground. You, know, you can pick anybody. So if you want to keep Kang, you can keep Kang. If you want to dump yourself from that baggage or perceive, you know, audience baggage or whatever, then yeah, you know, you can go to Doctor Doom if you want to usher in where we're now phase five of the Marvel MCU, whatever. I don't know. So yeah, and and not to get too off this show and into the last year of Marvel movie issues, but you know, they they've had a rough year of reception. If even if you know, despite your people's feelings about the movies themselves and whether they're good or bad, they they've not done well uh, in the theater realm. So. It may not. It may be an opportunity. I guess is what I'm saying to kind of kick off a new phase and trying to re- regenerate interest that they may not have gotten in the last year. Yeah, or maybe it's. I mean, it's been what almost was it 20, 2012 was the Avengers, but when was Iron Man? Like 2000, 2008. 2008. Yeah. So it's been you know sixteen years. So I mean, maybe it's time to give it a little break, at least the, the movie part, and maybe focus on the TV shows. If you can do TV shows like this, where it's it's short, quick, consolidated, tight, and good, which we'll talk, talk about maybe a minute, what we're going to do next maybe, that might be the way to go. Do the, do the TV bit, you know, kind of get the general populace ease off the movies and then come back with it. Yay, we're back again, bigger, you know, whatever, something, I don't know. But you know. Yeah, and, and in a less packed episode, since we've <laughs> talking for a bit on this one yeah you know, maybe we could dive into cinematic movies versus you know tv shows and, and the way those can work differently because you know i kind of feel like in the post 2020 rail world that we've had we are now i, I don't know that these kind of movies are going to be as successful right i think we may have seen a a shift in what works for the big box blusters right now and i think you know what were they up to at different points like six big MCU movies a year at, at various points over the last, like you said, 16 years, we've had some pretty jam packed schedules. And I just don't know that we can handle that, that, that the theater world can handle that right now. So that might be a fun thing to dive into at some point. Yeah. Just, you know, maybe rethink the movie thing or whatever, but yeah, who knows? I know they have ambitious plans as always. So we'll see if they can. Pull. Oh yeah. They're, they're better at making money than I am. I'll yeah. admit that. <laughs> All right, so that is it for Loki. Let's see, have something else you want to talk about uh, about the season we didn't mention? But... No, just not. We yeah, cap it back off with this was a great, great series. I, like I said, I'd be sad to see it go, but they did a really good job of capping it. If that's where they decide to end it, yeah, it'd be fun to go back and watch again and again to see if you can pick up some other little tiny things that oh that happened you know here in that one episode and they summed up again here or whatever. Yeah, who knows? Oh yeah, I bet there's some good Easter eggs that you could go yeah. find at the beginning that we didn't know about that they already knew. Mm-hmm. All right, so yeah, next time, maybe we just only Farscape. Uh, who knows? Although the second season of What If has finished now because they're doing like one a day, like the last part of December as we record this now in early, early 2024. Uh, so all nine episodes will be out and done, or actually are out and done, so I don't know. I haven't watched that yet. Same. Uh, yeah. Also, next week as we record this, the new Marvel series Echo it gets all five episodes at once dropped on Disney plus. That's probably way too ambitious to tackle all five uh, next time. <laughs> so we'll have to talk about that as we have another vacation coming up, but um, yeah, we'll see. Maybe we'll, I guess just look at the show notes and the episode title and you know what we're doing. <laughs> so. Yeah. You'll probably know about the same time we do. Yep. Or you've already watched it and you're like, why are they talking about that? Well, we will eventually <laughs> we'll get there. We have to keep some kind of random schedule. That's right. We're, we're random. Unless it's Farscape, everything else is who knows. Right, occasionally. Yep. All right, so that is your homework. If you're a Farscaper, you go back and listen to that part. You know what to do. Otherwise, stay tuned for what's coming next. And with that, we'll see you later. Goodbye. Goodbye.